we're all set, so we'll get started with the panel on uh, Japanese and, uh, and Buddhist perspectives. And to, to lead us in that is uh, Dr. Jesse Kirkpatrick. He was a fellow this year at the Stockdale Center. I was, it was an honor to work with you all year, Jesse, and, and thanks for doing the panel chair of duty. Great. Thanks, Ed. Is this on? Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay. Um, so again, thanks, Ed, and, and uh, all the staff at the Stockdale Center for the, uh, for the event. Huh? Uh, for the lunch, so hopefully you're all well fed and full and there's coffee. Um, so as Ed said, it's the, the panel is Japanese and Buddhist perspectives. Thanks. Um, and we're going to be going in the order of the presentation. So um, we'll be beginning with Professor Chris Ives. Uh, he's the Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Asian Studies Program at Stonehill College. Uh, he's published widely in uh, Buddhist, Buddhist ethics um, and, and uh, particularly in environmental issues and on violence and war. Well, thank you. Like the other speakers, uh, I do want to thank Dr. Colonel Ed Barrett and the Stockdale Center for inviting me uh, to make a presentation today and join with all of you. Now, as a scholar of Buddhism, I often meet people who would be perplexed by my title today, Buddhism and Warfare Ethics. That is to say, as you may know, in the popular imagination, Buddhism is pacifist. With the Dalai Lama receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989, People often see Buddhism as a religion of thoroughgoing nonviolence. With monks in saffron robes quietly meditating, people often view it as a religion of tranquility. Or they may see it as a religion of detachment. Some of my students embrace images of eccentric hermits up in the hills of Japan, writing haiku poems and sipping rice wine. Of course, that may say more about my students and their yearnings than it does about Buddhism. but. Um, and in fact, if we do look closely, these popular images of a peaceful, tranquil, and politically detached Buddhism don't square with the historical record. Like all religions, Buddhism has been involved in warfare, whether directly with monks and lay people taking up arms, or indirectly in supporting and justifying warfare. In Japan in the 1930s and 40s, for example, we see what has been termed Imperial Way Buddhism, one form of which is Imperial Way Zen Buddhism, which is the title of a 2009 book I wrote about ethical issues surrounding Zen support for the Imperial Way, or the Way of the Emperor, in Japanese Kodo during World War II. As I outline in that monograph, during World War II, prominent Zen masters, temples, and sectarian organizations participated in edification campaigns run by the state to cultivate obedient imperial subjects. They organized or participated actively in patriotic groups. In their temples, they exhorted parishioners to enlist in the military, practice austerity on the home front, and buy war bonds. Some Zen monks engaged each month in what they termed, quote, alms begging to serve the nation. And there are cases of abbots of monasteries donating temple funds for the construction of war planes. In addition, Zen masters ran officer training programs and meditation halls. They chanted scriptures to promote Japanese victory, assisted the families of the war dead, and served as chaplains for troops ser serving and fighting overseas, mainly by doing funerals and thereby consoling the spirits of soldiers who died unnatural deaths in terms of the Japanese view of natural death. In other words, people who died young, violently, and far from home. Uh, this derives from a Japanese folk belief in the need to properly memorialize the dead. And without proper mem memorialization, um, you could give rise to what are called onryo, or vengeful spirits of the unmourned dead. And the need, especially when people die, prematurely as young people, or violently in war, or far from their homes, that danger um, is especially exacerbated. Zen priests also helped in the pacification, sembu, of occupied and colonized areas, and in the molding of colonized, Asian, um, colonized Asians into imperial subjects. 
Prominent Zen figures also offered ideological support for Japanese imperialism. In writings, lectures, and sermons, they celebrated the imperial system, the Japanese state, and Japan's mission in Asia. They aligned Buddhist doctrines with constru constructs in the reigning imperial ideology. And in terms of our topic at this conference, they articulated something akin to a warfare ethic, a kind of just war theory, or more precisely, a Buddhist justification for Japanese military operations at that time. For example, Zen leaders claimed that the war Japan was waging across Asia was a holy war. They portrayed the military as intending to establish a peaceful Buddhist utopia here on Earth. They represented Japanese actions in that war as expressions of compassion. They instructed parishioners to see self-sacrifice as the way to repay their debt to the benevolent emperor. And in advocating such self-sacrifice for the emperor and the state, they championed the ethos of, quote, obliterating the self to serve the public, in Japanese, meshi hoko. In particular, Zen leaders celebrated the deaths of brave, self-sacrificial soldiers who embodied the Buddhist doctrine of selflessness. This ethic reflects the main Zen Buddhist element in Bushido, the traditional way of the warrior, which in relation to this conference could be seen as the main warfare ethic in at least modern Japanese history. Here we need to be careful, however, for Bushido is in large part a modern construct that did not necessarily inform the ethics and actions of warriors in earlier periods of Japanese history. But suffice it to say that this supposedly ancient warrior code or samurai code, exemplified by the heroes of countless popular legends and myths, comprised an ethos of self-discipline, self-sacrifice, single-mindedness, unhesitating obedience to one's lord, and utter fearlessness in the face of death. In his 1913 book, Religion of the Samurai, Zen priest Nukariya Kaiten argued that even ordinary citizens must be like a samurai, quote, brave, generous, upright, faithful, and manly, full of self-respect and self-confidence, and at the same time full of the spirit of self-sacrifice." The main Buddhist contribution to Bushido as a type of warfare ethic is a cluster of ideas about not being attached to oneself or one's life, about moving forward without flinching once one's course of action has been decided upon, and about not being rattled by the prospect of death. As you surely know, Buddhism was not alone in contributing to Bushido and supporting the imperial ideology in the Japanese military from the Meiji Restoration in 1868 to the end of the war in 1945. Most of the ethical values in Bushido, again, the warrior code, the way of the warrior, are Confucian. And the imperial ideology into which Buddhists wove their doctrines was largely Confucian and Shinto in character. One sees the Confucian hierarchical ethic of obedience and loyalty in the two main government statements of warfare ethics during modern Japanese imperialism. And if you want any details or references, I'm not using PowerPoint, so any of these texts or concepts, please come up to me afterwards or sometime later today or tomorrow. But those two main documents are the 1882 Imperial Rescript to Military Personnel, Gunjin Chokuyu, and the 1941 Field Service Code, Senjin-kun, a short tract presented to the Japanese by War Minister Tojo Hideki and carried by soldiers into battle. Emperor Meiji's 1882 rescript to military personnel includes the statement, the soldier and sailor should consider loyalty their essential duty and bear in mind that duty is heavier than a mountain and death is lighter than a feather. This loyalty is especially owed to the emperor, the benevolent national patriarch in the great family that is Japan, with an array of Confucian values informing the behavior of imperial subjects, the children below him in the national family. 
These themes find expression in the 1941 Field Service quote, uh, Code, and I quote again, imperial benevolence is extended to all without favor, while the imperial virtues enlighten the world. The people, too, handing down the traditions of loyalty, filial piety, and valor from generation to generation, and thereby enhancing the morality peculiar to the empire have assisted the throne, thus constituting a perfect national unity under the throne. And the text continues, it is essential that each man, high and low, dutifully observing his place, should be determined to sacrifice himself for the whole, without giving even the slightest thought to personal interest or to death and life. The imperial ideology also drew from Shinto. It portrayed the emperor as reigning in an unbroken lineage stretching all the way back to the sun goddess Amaterasu. In some iterations, the imperial ideology deemed the emperor a Shinto god here in our midst, or simply something sacred, as seen in the third article of the 1889 constitution. Quote, the emperor is sacred and inviolable. The oligarchs who lifted up the emperor in the late 19th century also recast and mobilized Shinto priests, practices, and institutions into what has been termed state Shinto. The term state Shinto, according to Harvard scholar Helen Hardiker, is used to describe the systematic state support for Shinto from the beginning of the Meiji period, 1868, to the end of World War II. It encompassed government support for and regulations of shrines and priests, the emperor's priestly roles, state creation of Shinto doctrine and ritual, construction of shrines in Japan's colonies, compulsory participation in shrine rites, teaching Shinto myth as history, and suppression of other religions that contradicted some aspect of Shinto. The core site of state Shinto was the Yasukuni Shrine to the War Dead in Tokyo. And we, could and we could devote an entire conference to the controversies surrounding this site in the post-war period, including the present. Um, as some of you may know, I just heard about this yesterday, driving in my car, listening to NPR, and immediately when I got to my office, went onto my computer. But uh, in the past 48 hours, there's been a flap um, that erupted after pop star uh, Justin Bieber um, who was there in Tokyo, visited the shrine and prayed. Um, apparently he was driving around with a driver in Tokyo, looked out the window and saw the, the grand um, entranceway to the shrine, decided to jump out and see that part of Japan. Uh, apparently went and did some praying, took some photographs, um, uploaded them to Instagram with a caption, thank you for the blessings. Um, Immediately with that on the internet, um, all of his fans in Korea and China, I guess where he's going on his tour next, exploded in anger. Um, and within about uh, 24 hours, he took the photos down and sent out, I don't know, a tweet or something expressing remorse. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, he did apologize to his Korean and Chinese fans. And um, little did he know he was stepping onto an interesting shrine uh, precinct to pray that day. Um, I think it may have happened Wednesday, just yesterday, Japan time, that he did this. Um, but let me return to Buddhism, my main focus in this talk today. As a scholar of Buddhist ethics, my interest is not so much in how Zen Buddhist statements and actions during the war diverge from popular representations of Zen as a nonviolent religion or a path of awakened eccentrics free from political co-optation engaged in poetry and pranks in the mountains of East Asia. Rather, what I found intriguing is how Buddhist support for the Japanese military during the war seems to stand in tension with core components of the Buddhist ethical system. For example, one, the five Buddhist precepts or moral guidelines, especially the first, no harming or no killing. Two, the Buddhist focus on purifying the mind of anger and cultivating compassion. Three, doctrines of selflessness and non-attachment, which might imply that Buddhist leaders should be free from narrow self-interest at the individual, institutional, or national levels. Four, the bodhisattva ideal, compassionate, saintly figures 
who make vows to liberate all sentient beings, an ostensibly universal orientation beyond parochialism. And five, the Buddhist value of restraint, which might imply that the Buddhist influence on Japanese warfare ethics has been a restraining of unnecessary or purely destructive violence. Though these Buddhist ideals could restrain violence or lead Buddhists to speak truth to power, historically these ideals have been trumped by institutional self-interest. That is to say, since Buddhism was imported into Japan in the sixth century, Buddhist leaders and institutions have generally been close to those in power, existing in a symbiotic relationship. Buddhists have chanted certain scriptures and performed rituals that are seen as protecting rulers in the country. And in return, rulers have provided protection, land, building materials, and peasant labor. As Alain Grappard of UC Santa Barbara once put it, rituals were the coinage through which monks purchased patronage. In this respect, Japanese Buddhism has often been called, quote, Buddhism for the protection of the realm. And in traditional texts, we find a lot of discourse about, quote, the interdependence of the emperor's law and the Buddha's law, or the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha. In other words, until the post-war constitution went into effect in 1947, there was never any significant attempt to separate church and state in Japan. This is one reason why Buddhist involvement in warfare ethics has usually taken the form of uncritically supporting warrior leaders rather than criticizing specific instances of warfare or certain types of warfare. Simply put, over the centuries, the Japanese Buddhist warfare ethic has been one of uncritically enabling, not ethically restraining. As a result, Japanese Buddhists have never formulated a rigorous, systematic, self-critical just war theory like we see in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This has not been for a lack of resources, for Buddhist ethicists could draw from such core Buddhist values as non-harming, compassionate intention, and the commitment to reducing suffering in the world. This lack of sustained grappling with war extends beyond Japan and pertains to other Buddhist areas of Asia. This is not to say that there has not been a de facto just war theory or just violence theory in Buddhism over the centuries, however. If we take a close look at Buddhist texts across Asia, we see that despite numerous injunctions against violence, the religion is replete with justifications of violence. And these justifications have centered on three overlapping arguments. First, violence is justifiable when used by highly realized Buddhists to A, prevent robbers, murderers, and other evil people from engaging in violence and thereby exposing themselves to dire karmic consequences, and B, to also prevent them from harming the potential victims of their violence. Insofar as this compassionate use of violence serves the evil person and protects innocent people, this violence may be meritorious for the wise and compassionate perpetrator. Second, violence is justifiable when it serves to protect the religion, especially by eliminating the threat posed by heretics and other types of evil people. And third, violence is justifiable when it serves to protect those who protect the religion, whether the ruler or more broadly, the state. Since World War II, some leaders of mainline Buddhist denominations have acknowledged the need to critique these traditional justifications and begin to set forth a rigorous Buddhist just war theory. But to date, they have not yet done so. As a result, post-war Japanese Buddhism has not, to my knowledge, made any significant contributions to efforts by those in the self-defense forces to address questions of warfare ethics, though Admiral Ota may have a better sense of this than I do. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Ives. Um, we'll reserve our questions until Amarota has his opportunity to speak. And do you want to speak sitting down or at the no. podium? Okay. Oh, no, over there. Ah, okay. Um, well, uh, Vice Admiral Ota is going to be uh, speaking on um, Japanese warfare ethics. 
Dr. Ota holds a PhD from Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. And he's written widely and published widely on uh, Japanese strategic studies and ethics. Uh, and uh, he told me over, over lunch that he um, has also taught at the US Naval Academy uh, from 1980 to 1982. He taught um, CNAV, is that right? So uh, please welcome Dr. Ota. Thank you very much. Well, this is uh, Annapolis is a special place for me. It's a good, uh, good memory, uh, especially right after I get married in 1980, and then coming down here with my new wife. And uh, first son was born in Annapolis, and uh, he became uh, 33 years old, and uh, get the grandson, uh, uh, grandson recently. But anyway, uh, the uh, more than uh, 30 years, some years, so my English is a little rusty. So I'd like to uh, uh, read my paper and also use a PowerPoint in compensate uh, my uh, uh, pronunciation. <coughs> okay, in some, uh, in his book, The Soldiers and the, the, the State, Samir Huntington stated, to a larger extent, the officer's code is expressed in custom, tradition, and continuing spirit of the professions. When <coughs> looking at Japanese warfare ethics, we should go back to Kojiki, written in the 6th century, which is Japan's oldest publication before Buddhism was introduced into Japan from continent. In Kojiki, we find the statement of ideal warrior named Itsuno Obari, reverently, I will obey and serve. As the typical ethics which symbolize the brave royalty in a state of national emergency. This spirit of utter loyalty is also found in Prince Shotoku's 17th Article Constitution as absolute submission to imperial command and in Sakimori, Frontier God's poetry of Japanese oldest poet, Mayoshu, as reverence for maj majesty of the great lord during the 17th, uh, 7th century. Therefore, warfare ethics during the Japanese ancient history may symbolize royalty with propriety. During the 8th century, Sun Tzu, the art of war was introduced into Japanese mission to Tong, China. From the end of 11th century <coughs> to the beginning of 12th century, the first Japanese warfare called Tosenkyo, meaning Bible for fighting the war, prevailed. Tosenkyo's motto was sincere and straightforward and criticized Sun Tzu as a deceit book and admired Wazi, is that correct uh, pronunciation? Wazi as a more ethical Chinese military strategy. Japan, however, was defeated by China three times in her history by following that motto and emphasizing straightforward wizard manipulation. The first defeat was Battle of Baikugan in 663, when Japan, Baikugan is uh, the western part of uh, current uh, Republic Korea. Uh, Japan and her ally, Baikju, fought against the allied force of Sida, the eastern part of uh, the current uh, ROK, and the Tong Dynasty of ancient China. Allied forces waited and were trapped at the narrow river, then Japanese warriors thrusted and were completely defeated. The second Japanese uh, defeat followed the Japanese invasion of Korea at the end of 16th century when Toyotomi Hideyoshi attacked Joseon Jos Jos Dynasty Korea and Min Dynasty China. The attack was done bravely but without enough intelligence and were defeated. 
The third example was the Second Sino-Japanese War from 1937 to 1945. Japanese Imperial Army defeated Kuomintang Army in each battle tactically, but strategically was defeated by the Communist Party of China, who let Japan Imperial Army and Kuomintang Army fight each other. Anyway, however, Japanese warriors make straightforward valor very important. From the end of 12th century to 19th century, Japan was governed by samurai, <coughs> also known as Bushi, and Bushido has developed. The Japanese philosophical basis for warfare ethics was derived from Bushido. What is Bushido? Dr. Inazo Nitobe, who served as Under Secretary General of League of Nations at the beginning of the 20th century, wrote a book titled Bushido in 1990. In his book, Dr. Nitobe listed Bushido, the nine typical virtues. Those are rectitude or justice, courage, benevolence, politeness, veracity, and sincerity, honor, the duty of loyalty, education and training of samurai, and self-control. His motivation to write the book Bushido was as follows. It's very interesting. He was asked by the venerable professor, do you have any religious instruction in your school? After Dr. Nitobe responded with no, the professor was surprised with saying, no religion. How do you impart moral education? The moral precept, prescript which Dr. Nitobe learned in his childhood days were not taught in schools and the found that it was Bushido. I would say, however, Japanese morale are uh, derived from not only Bushido, but also through general education done by the family and civil community. After the Meiji Restoration, the Emperor Meiji created the imperial precept to the soldiers and sailors in 1887. This consists of five articles, which were loyalty, propriety, valor, faithfulness, and righteousness, and simplicity. At the end, it state, now for putting them into practice, the most important is sincerity. Nowadays, many people in Japan criticize the imperial precept to the soldiers and sailors as obsolete and old-fashioned. <coughs> However, if you extract the common aspect of all countries' military code of ethics, the five code in the imperial precept to the soldiers and sailors reflect those common points. For example, the United States military ethics are loyalty, duty, respect, self-service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. The United Kingdom's military ethics are duty, honor, mutual trust, morality, and quick relevant decision making. In Germany, loyalty, duty, discipline, valor, moral virtue, and democracy are taught. French identified discipline, respect for traditions, selflessness, commitment, through frugality, and self-sacrifice. That frugality is similar to the ethics of simplicity, the last item of imperial precept to the soldiers and sailors. <coughs> Okay, therefore, it, uh, if we as Western armed forces established common military code of ethics for coalition use, I believe 
that will be feasible and advisable. In my opinion, the imperial precept to the soldiers and sailors is better than Bushido spirit itself, because Bushi, the warrior, were privileged class set above farmers, artisans, and merchants during the feudal age. It left no rule for members of classes other than Bushi. Their royalty was focused on only their lord and not to their state, Japan. In 1992, when I was a visiting scholar at Stanford University, they held a warfare ethics seminar. Many of participants criticized Japanese soldiers' brutal behavior in World War II, which happened despite the existence of such splendid code in the imperial precept. Uh, imperial precept. Undoubtedly, <coughs> the Japanese imperial army treated prisoners of war brutally during the World War II. This was a consequence of Japanese arrogance against Asians, which came about especially after Japanese victory in the First Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War. Many Japanese soldiers and sailors forgot imperial precept, especially the second item, <coughs> uh, uh, the propriety. As a British strategist, uh, strategist Lily Hart stated in his book, Strategy, chivalry in war can be a most effective weapon in weakening the opponent's will to resist, as well as augmenting moral strength. <coughs> in the Imperial Navy, in Japanese Navy, Five uh, reflections were established in 1932 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the promulgation of the imperial precept by the Royal <coughs> uh, Rear Admiral Hajime Matsushita, then the superintendent of Japanese Imperial Naval Academy. He was concerned about the views of naval officers involved in the attempt coup d'etat by Imperial Army and Navy young officers in 1932, where Matsushita invited a British instructor named Cecil Burke to be an in English instructor and said to him, Mr. Burke, what I want you to do is to teach our midshipmen what the British gentleman is uh, and how gentlemen behave. The five restrict uh, reflections were, has though not gone against sincerity. The second, has though not felt ashamed of the, the word and deed. Thirdly, has though not lacked vigor. vigor. Fourthly, has though exerted all possible effort. And fifthly, has though not become throatful. After study and before going to bed, each midshipman was required to read aloud those five ref reflections and examine himself on the day. The Imperial Naval Academy's inf infrastructure transferred into the current Maritime Self Defense Force Officer Candidate School, and five reflections are still followed by midshipmen today. In January 1941, the warrior code, it's a, he said the field code, the same thing. The warrior code was promulgated by Army Minister General Tojo. This was a reaction to violations against military discipline during the Sino-Japanese conflict. Therefore, warrior code stated, do not contempt the enemy and civilians. Be considered to protect the enemy prop property and asset, and protect innocent citizens. However, the code was not well received because it was written in very difficult Chinese characters, not understood by many soldiers who had not graduated even from elementary school. 
There are also a couple of wrong theories from a military scientific perspective. For example, the notorious phrases, don't accept the shame of being taken alive as a prisoner, is in warrior code. Additionally, the concept that the Imperial Army has a tradition of 100 wins out of 100 battles is inconsistent with historical fact because of the defeat of Battle of ba Bakuyegan in 663 and the defeat of Toyotomidios in the 16th century. The warrior code denies the concept of retreat, which is also wrong from the military scientific perspective. Samuel Huntington criticized the Japanese soldiers' professionalism, professionalism by citing the warrior's code in the state and uh, soldiers and the state, but he failed to mention the imperial precept to the soldiers and sailors, which has much more influenced for both sailors and sa uh, soldiers and sailors. After the end of World War II, the Japanese government established the ethos of self-defense force personnel in 1961, which consists of five virtues. Awareness of mission, individual development, fearfulness of responsibility, strict, uh, strict obedience of discipline, and strengthening of solidarity. These virtues are uh, in the self-defense force pocketbook, like, like that. This is an uh, example. Pocketbook. And every self-defense force member is able to review them at any time. The virtues are often tested by higher officials during inspections. Personally, I believe the imperial precept to the soldiers and sailors is much better than the, uh, the ethos of self-defense force. Uh, because first, the ethos of self-defense force personnel does not specify loyalty and valor, probably because of the ethics uh, of self-defense force personnel was created during a period of pacifism right after World War II. Secondly, the ethos of self-defense force past, uh, personnel has less emotional charge than the imperial precept. Each self-defense force so, uh, service has sought to define its own ethos. About 10 years ago, the Japanese Grand Self-Defense Force decided uh, service ethos, which are challenge, dedication, and sincerity. The Maritime Self-Defense Force tried to create their new ethos, namely pride, valor, and loyalty but that has not yet been officially authorized. Interestingly, those qualities are very similar to the imperial precept. I believe the salesman's virtues do not change over time and geography. Air Service Defense Force does not have an overall effort. However, about eight years ago, uh, then Chief of Air Staff Office provided effort only for pilot which are to be bright and frank, train and prepare, and deed and practice. The National Defense Academy, <coughs> equivalent of a combination of Annapolis, West Point, and Colorado Springs in the United States, was established in 1953. The first president, Tomo Omaki, was graduated from Oxford University, so his ethics education derived from the United Kingdom. The class of 1965 cadet created an owner of conduct system which consists of three virtues, owner, courage, and propriety. The propriety in the owner of conduct is slightly different with the propriety in the imperial precept, which means rather courtesy or polite. Those three items are displayed on the floor at the entrance of the main building. Cadets in the National Defense Academy organize an owner of conduct committee and examine cadet behavior. The National Defense Academy has an owner of conduct uh, committee which monitor 
how well cadet demonstrate honor in their conduct. When I was a cadet in the late 1960s, I was made chairman of the Honor of Conduct Committee. I asked all of my fellow cadets to find out the roots of the Honor of Conduct in our history. Then I reached the conclusion the primary virtues of Honor of, honor of Conduct were derived from Teshu Yamaoka's Bushido in the 16th century, which uh, propriety, valor, and honor. During their second year, the cadet <coughs> and midshipman at the National Defense Academy uh, undertake an Iwo Jima battle tour, right here, down here. This helps to drip to their motivation and uh, provide a good opportunity to consider warfare ethics. Though many military schools educate in the leadership and the discipline, they teach warfare ethics and sometimes make seminars uh, using uh, the case studies. Commanders and higher ranking officers occasionally make presentations regarding morale in the service. Additionally, <coughs> In many self-defense force bases, there are museums which focus on brilliant soldiers and sailors from the throughout the, the world and since the beginning of the military history. Self-defense force personnel look at those examples and were impressed by their achievement. This is the so-called set the example method. During the, uh, the constraint of the current constitution, the Japanese self-defense force have so far not been used in actual combat mission. They have, however, been conducting peacekeeping operation, nation building operation, anti-piracy operation, and humanitarian assistant disaster relief since 1992, including Cambodia, East Timor, Operation Enduring Freedom in Arabian Gulf, Iraq, Sudan, Gulf of Aden, Indian Ocean Tsunami, and aftermath of the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami followed by the accident of Fukushima nuclear plant. <coughs> the self-defense force behavior and professionalism during those PKO and HADR operations earned the highest respect, and especially during the 2011 earthquakes, self-defense force personnel demonstrated strong selflessness and dedication. Subsequently, according to the recent um, uh, national survey, the most reliable institution in Japan is the Self Defense Force. This is the same in the United States, where the US military arm, uh, armed forces are the number one institution. When, <coughs> when you station in Japan, most of the American soldiers and sailors find out that Japanese people are kind, honest, and work hard in general, and that Japan is the most safest country and has a very low crime rate. Japan is a safe society where a single young lady can walk alone even at midnight. According to the, the BBC Global <coughs> uh, Polio, in last year, Japan has most positive influence in the world. I think this is the greatest uh, uh, the soft, soft power asset. Commodore Matthew Perry, who was the first U.S. naval officer to land in Japan in 1853, <coughs> wrote, uh, also wrote the same impression at that time. Our DNA did not drastically change during World War II. Therefore, I would say that notorious stories such as more than 300,000 massacres in Nanjing and 200,000 compulsory sex slaves are exaggerated propaganda from China and Korea. In conclusion, the current Japanese military organization has no specific of warfare ethic education. However, each self-defense force member has a 
philosophical basis of Bushido and then learned ethics through a thought of self-defense force personnel as well as the guidance from their supervisors and their seniors example displayed at the museum. Thank you very much. Amarillota. Uh, we'll open up the floor for questions. We've, uh, we have 15 minutes and uh, I've been asked to tell you to speak into the mic, so I'll pass it along if you have questions. So. You focus primarily on Zen. I was interested why uh, you didn't, for example, take up Nichiren Shoshu or Soka Gakkai or some of those other movements that we think of more as, as, as more clearly identified with nationalism in Japan. Yeah, you may have heard at one point I said mainline Buddhist denominations in terms of the traditional sects, um, but you're absolutely right. If you look at um, some of the new religious movements, um, Soka Gakkai, uh, which is also popular here in the U.S., starting in the 1930s and spinning off of one of the traditional denominations, Nichiren Buddhism. Um, yeah, there you get a different type of Buddhist um, stance around war, um, more thoroughgoing critiques of Japanese militarism during the war. And then in the post-war period, yeah, they would be um, sort of the Buddhist voice that might be raising issues about, you know, the security treaty with the U.S. or U.S. bases in Okinawa and a lot of those issues that, um, in a sense, more progressive Japanese will raise. So um, they would be, in a sense, the exception. Uh, but the mainline traditional denominations, in large part, you know, have not really spoken to these issues, um, either supporting the state or, like Soka Gakkai, being critical of things like the defense treaty with the U.S. So. Um, but yeah, there are cases of certain Buddhist groups um, being a little bit more politically active. Um, and a lot of that's in the post-war period. Um, I'll just comment, um, often um, Soka Gakkai will talk about its founder, Makiyuchi Tsune Saburo in the 1930s, um, who actually died in prison. Um, he was one of the few Buddhists in Japan, um, few religious person in general. There were a few Jehovah's Witnesses that never um, submitted to the state and sort of hung tough with their allegiance and we're not going to put the emperor above Christ or whatever. And uh, some of the founders of that religious movement also um, were tried for less majesty for insulting the, uh, the throne. And in Makiguchi's case, he was reluctant to have the emperor being seen as having a higher ontological status than the Lotus Sutra, this Buddhist scripture on which this type of Buddhism is based. And for that, he was in prison and died in prison during World War II. Um, what's interesting, though, is a lot of his followers in the post-war period say Makiguchi died for his pacifism. Um, but I've looked at this over the years, and I've asked a lot of people, even in Sogakai, give me one piece of evidence that he ever spoke out against Japanese militarism or the war and that evidence doesn't exist. He actually died for um, hanging tough with his religious beliefs as opposed to opposing the war. Um, now that may be splitting hairs. It's very courageous for anyone to hang tough with their beliefs in a very oppressive situation. So in that sense, he was an admirable person, but um, he did not necessarily die for opposing the war. It was more for supporting his beliefs. He didn't want the emperor to be elevated above that scripture. really did address, I think, mainly um, causes for going to war or using violence. I guess my question is, is in bello, um, are in bello conditions and criteria addressed within this de facto theory, and if so, how? Yeah, that, that's a good question, and maybe I'll, I'll also direct my response partly to Admiral Ota. Um, I know a lot of you work much more in just war theory and warfare ethics than I do, and over lunch we were talking about, I was asking as a, someone who's a bit of an outsider to warfare ethics and you know less so in just war theory, but asking what exactly is the difference between warfare ethics and just war theory? Um, and yeah, I got an explanation in terms of how they might be related. Um, but one thing, and I just throw out for everyone, and maybe for Admiral Ota, the in bello, the use in bello, um, when you look at, for example, in the Meiji Emperor's rescript, those values about loyalty and self-sacrifice, et cetera, um, 
the interesting thing to think about is, okay, that is perhaps the individual soldier's ethic, and in many ways it's very much of a Confucian loyalty, duty, obedience ethic, um, but that doesn't, that it's really the individual soldier's relationship to the Lord traditionally or the commander, the emperor, um, as opposed to non-combatants on the other side in terms of use in bellow. Um, and so one question, maybe I throw this out to everyone is, you know, something I'm just thinking about, that kind of ethic of self-sacrifice, loyalty, it is a cluster of virtues surrounding an individual soldier, but at one level, are not some of those virtues ethically neutral in terms of to what end is that self-sacrifice, that loyalty, that you know, obedience, to, to what end is it directed? And that's where I would say the you know, Emperor Meiji's ethic in the Meiji period needs just war theory to say, okay, we have these dedicated self-sacrificial loyal soldiers, but to what end are they engaged in military activities? And that's where we bring in the question of, you know, like, you know, use ad bellum, you know, competent authority, who's making the decision, you know, last resort, just cause, et cetera, or in terms of use in bellow, whether it's proportionality or non-combatant immunity. Um, and so in one respect, you know, maybe that sort of answers my question at lunch, how do these relate? Some of what we just presented, this sort of Confucian Bushido ethic, really has to do with the warrior and his obedience and willingness to face death, but that can be directed toward totally insidious ends. Um, that's where we have just war theory saying, okay, we have these loyal and dedicated soldiers who are willing to die for the state, but to what end are legitimate or competent authorities directing our military forces? Is this military endeavor just or not? And that brings in, for me, a whole nother level of morality, which really is just war theory, as opposed to a cluster of virtues of soldiers, which, depending on the purpose of the military activity, we could say could be just or unjust. In other words, in an unjust war, you could have soldiers embodying that 19th century ethic, being totally faithful, loyal, self-sacrificial, but the entire war as a whole could be radically unjust. So maybe that's where you know warfare ethics in one respect, the soldier's virtues, needs just war theory to maybe complete a larger ethical response to our world and all its complexities and you know the whole question of military violence. Yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting. That's more of a question for all of you rather than you know, this is a thought that just came to me, you know, listening to Admiral Ota's talk, but yeah, please. Question to General Lota, please. Um, since the armed forces are called uh, Japan's defense forces or self-defense forces, um, how does uh, Japan justify sending its troops um, to help other citizens, other countries? And how does it justify it, I mean, to its own citizens? Yeah, uh, that was changed uh, in 1992 and uh, uh, that is starting from uh, the peacekeeping operation uh, in Cambodia. Uh, the right behind, before that, uh, just a mine sweeping operation in the Gulf, uh, Arabian Gulf. So that is, uh, uh, well, uh, so many uh, Japanese merchant ships uh, passing through the uh, Arabian Gulf, and then there are no contribution toward the safety or security of sea land communication, and just rely on the U.S. Navy. That is uh, the kind of free rider and that is uh, not the uh, proper attitude toward uh, the international, uh, sound international community member. So that is why uh, we despised uh, many peacekeeping operations and uh, anti-piracy operations. Uh, and then uh, each time we, uh, the cabinet decided the uh, decision and just very limited weapons and limited numbers and uh, sent troops. So that, that's why, uh, that is the history of our uh, the sending troops in, in uh, overseas. I think we have time for one more question. Um, look, uh, this is for both of you. We've, we have heard in, in recent years uh, some de about debates within Japan about modifying the pacifist character of the Japanese constitution, and I was wondering if you could uh, um, comment on what those debates are and where they're headed. Well, uh, I think <coughs> our constitution is very difficult to uh, alter 
uh, because uh, they need a two third of m a majority of diet member. And that make uh, the General MacArthur, of course, after World War II. And it's very difficult to, uh, to amend uh, the Constitution. But recently, international uh, security environment is very severe toward us uh, in terms of uh, the Chinese naval expansion and North Korean uh, the, uh, nuclear weapon development. So we are going to exercise of collective defense light. Uh, that the, uh, every country uh, authorized exercise of collective uh, defense right, but only Japan said that every country have a right to collective uh, 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 right of uh, the correct, correct de uh, uh, defense right, but Japan cannot exercise the collective defense uh, because of the con Pacific con Constitution. But we are going to uh, change interpretation in, uh, in uh, pr especially Prime Minister Abe, and then going to consolidate much more uh, a good, strong relation with uh, the, uh, the, our ally with the United States. So that's my observation. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick comment in, in terms of Article 9 of the post-war Constitution. I mean, it's it's a very complex issue, you know, whether it's um, President or Prime Minister Abe's motivation at present. Um, yeah, as Admiral Ota was saying, there are a lot of Japanese feel that you know the 1947 Constitution was imposed by the U.S. occupation. It's one part of a larger issue of victor's justice. Um, a lot of conservatives in Japan, as you know, do not respect the findings of the um, War Crimes Tribunal for the Far East after um, World War II. And a lot of the issues about the Yasukuni Shrine, government support of the shrine, Article 9, textbooks, uh, there's a whole cluster of interrelated issues. Um, simply put, you know, a lot of conservative Japanese would say, yeah, it is victor's justice, it's a victor's constitution, and you know, our wings are kind of clipped. We're not a fully sovereign state. We're still there um, restricted in terms of Article 9 and renouncing the use of forces except in self-defense. Um, and so a lot of Japanese say, yeah, for us to become a full sovereign state, Article 9 needs to be rejected. But the related issues um, are such that, yeah, it's, it's a political hot potato in Japan because a lot of people see it as also related to revisionist interpretations of World War II, um, attempts to change the emperor from the post-war symbol of the state to something back to more of the wartime emperor. And so there's just a very complicated, interconnected set of issues hanging over this. Um, so at one level, it's, yeah, Japanese wanting to become a normal sovereign state by having this rejected, but there's a whole array of other things that come in the second people talk about that. Um, you know, there's 20 or 30, you know, issues connected to that one issue of sovereign statehood. Great. Well, Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, I saw another. I saw another. Did I see a? Okay. Sure. I'm not sure how relevant this question is to your discussion, but I wonder uh, how uh, this recent massacre of Muslims in Myanmar was justified by uh, the idea of just war, and also if you are aware that. Uh, Mm, uh, Dalai Lama took any position uh, regarding that issue. Yeah, yeah. The 969 movement, um, sort of radically nationalist um, Myanmar or Burmese priests, um, it really fits what I was saying. Is often there in the traditional sort of de facto just war theory or justification of violence across the centuries across Asia, and this very conservative, um, uh, yeah xenophobic subgroup of um, Myanmar or Burmese Buddhists um, are basically there in that province, province looking at refugees, many of which who came in from Bangladesh, um, and many of whom are Muslim, and there's a xenophobic um, scapegoating mechanism going on in terms of they're here, they're uh, parasites on social support systems, um, they're not really with the program in terms of Burma being a largely Buddhist country. Um, and so there's been a lot of scapegoating um, in that border region. And uh, 
if you look carefully at some of the, um, there's one priest in particular who's a very <coughs> outspoken um, critic of this minority Muslim population. Um, you'll never find him directly inciting violence or advocating violence, but um, a lot of his comments are very incendiary in terms of, you know, pointing the finger, scapegoating, um, you know, basically saying, you know, they are draining social support systems, they're not really Burmese, they're a problem, they're inferior, they're evil. Um, and then the implication is for a lot of the followers, yeah, deal with them, you know, basically use violence and try to eradicate them. So um, a very scary situation. And that's, you know, an instance of, you know, the Dharma, the Buddhist teachings just aren't in play. It's basically, uh, you know, us, them, xenophobic, nasty human behavior, and Buddhist values don't seem to be, you know, restraining this kind of incendiary statements. I actually don't know. You were saying that you had, oh, that was your second question. Yeah, I don't know. 